All right. Well, I see that we're uh, we're coming right up on uh, seven o'clock now. Um, so it's uh, always important that uh, as we begin, uh, that we do so uh, in acknowledgement of the, the place where we uh, gather um, in, in virtual time and uh, in, uh, in real time, uh, that uh, there are, are people who have been here before us. And, uh, and so we acknowledge that. So as we, we begin, we do acknowledge that King's University at Western is located in close proximity to three vibrant local First Nations who have longstanding relationships with the land and place that we now recognize as London, Ontario. Uh, Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. And historically, the Attawadurong peoples also once settled this region alongside the Algonquin and Haudenosaunee peoples and used this land as their traditional beaver hunting grounds. Today, a diverse and growing Indigenous population live in London and the surrounding areas. Many here tonight may not be Indigenous, but we are all treaty people, along with all of the responsibilities and duties that that entails. And so it's important to remember that uh, when we acknowledge we're not just uh, taking part in a formality, that we are each called to constantly work and to advocate for the freedom of all people and join in the stewardship of this land. So uh, my name is uh, Jim Pancho. I'm a deacon and a pastoral counselor uh, as part of the campus ministry team at King's. Um, it's also my great pleasure to uh, host this uh, Veritas uh, series. And uh, this evening, uh, I'm particularly um, uh, pleased to, uh, to welcome uh, Darren Diaz to be with us. Um, just as a uh, by way of process for this evening. I'm sorry, it's been a long day. I have to tell you, all of you who have been on, on Zoom for hours at a time know what my brain is doing right now. But just to say, so in terms of process for this evening, be, work with me here. Um, as you're uh, well aware that we're using a webinar format this evening. And uh, so what that means is that we'll get the best lecture quality possible, but it, it limits the, the way that we can interact with each other. Um, and so I would just like you to make note on your screen of the, the Q&A function. Uh, there's a button probably at the bottom of your screen. If you, uh, at any time uh, during the lecture, you can enter uh, questions into that uh, uh, section. And then when we move to the Q&A time, I'll uh, moderate those questions. Um, you're also free to use the uh, chat function uh, to ask questions um, in, in real time, um, as long as you know, they're not too obtrusive, okay? So with respectfully, okay? And uh, so we'll, we'll uh, go with what happens tonight and, uh, and, and uh, hope for the best. But um, just as we uh, change uh, gears a little bit, it, um, it's always good to know what your options are. So uh, just by way of introduction, um, for those who don't know, uh, Dr. Darren Diaz is a Dominican priest, and he holds positions as an associate professor and graduate director in the Faculty of Theology at the University of St. Michael's College in Toronto. His area of research includes the intersection of lived religion and doctrine, and in particular, Trinitarian theology and religious diversity. Having served on the Roman Catholic Hindu Dialogue of Canada, he has recently been appointed to the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, Canadian Council of Imams Working Group. Now, some recent publications uh, include Interreligious Dialogue as Language Negotiation, um, published in 2020, uh, Peter Clavery, Holiness in a World Church, also published last year, Trinity, Elemental Meaning and Psychic Conversion, a Pastoral Consideration, published last year, and an edited volume, Church Migration and Global Indifference, um, also published last year with uh, Michael Attridge and Yaroslav uh, Skira. So from all that, I think that you will agree that we're very fortunate to welcome Dr. Diaz to King's and to speak with us this evening about interreligious dialogue today um, and a Christian perspective. Our lecture this evening is co-sponsored by the Center for Jewish Catholic Muslim Learning here at King's. Dr. Diaz, welcome. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm sad I can't be with you all in person. Um, 
obviously because of the pandemic. I always enjoy my trips to London and to the campus of Kings and and to participating in the life of that college. So when this is over, hopefully I will uh, I'll be there and um, and be able to see you all in person. Right? That's what we're all hoping for. And uh, the good thing is, uh, in this context, I don't have to make an excuse for my bad hair because I think we're all, we at least in Toronto, we're unable to get our hair cuts. So I'll begin. <clears throat> On the 1st of August, uh, 1996, a bomb blast shot through the Episcopal residence in Oran, Algeria, killing its beloved bishop, Pierre Clavery, and his friend and sometime driver, Mohamed Bouchiki. The blood of a Roman Catholic bishop intermingled with the blood of a young Muslim friend in the soil of land marred by violence and war. The advertised title of this presentation is very general. Interface dialogue, uh, you know, before I should say, I'm gonna, I, I get, uh, as Jim said, it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard to navigate all the, uh, the Zooms that we've been doing. So uh, I spoke to Jim ahead of time. I'm gonna use a bit of PowerPoint every now and again, and I'm even gonna show part of the video just to break up the time so you're not always just listen to my voice because I think that in the Zoom world, you need a, a bit of a break. So from time to time, you'll see the screen will change with a, a PowerPoint presentation like I'm gonna try it right now. So the, the advertised title of this presentation is very general, Interfaith Dialogue Today, A Christian Perspective. The perspective that I propose this evening is one of many possible and valid approaches to interfaith dialogue. An underlying claim that I do not explicitly treat is that it is the concrete lived experience of the church that informs the doctrine that shapes a perspective on other religions. The concrete experience that I will explore is a story of Pierre Clavery, the Bishop of Oran, and the last Algerian martyr to be killed in 1996. His story demonstrates that the Catholic perspective on dialogue is informed by the living witness of a creative minority, not uh, afraid to confront the reality of their historical situation and one that models what is possible for the wider Christian community. My talk this evening will be divided into two main parts. Uh, the first part, The first part uh, begins with a brief history of the colonial history of Algeria before turning to the story of Pierre Clavery himself. Although the narrative I explore in the first part is rooted in the specific history of Christian Muslim relations in Algeria, the second part of the talk speaks to the significance of the narrative for the whole church today. After analyzing a few aspects of the beatification liturgy of Clavery, I will conclude briefly by treating a last artifact that shapes Catholic Christian uh, perspectives on interfaith dialogue, and that's Pope Francis's most recent encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, or on fraternity and social friendship. Now, I don't claim there's any direct correlation between the narrative of Pierre Clavery and the encyclical. I simply wish to demonstrate how the themes of solidarity and friendship are relational vectors that give depth and meaning to a Christian perspective on dialogue. Part one, Pierre Clavery, context, life, and death. The French conquest of Algeria. The French con, I'm gonna try and share my screen with a few. There we go, the French conquest of Algeria began in 1830 and was complete by 1875 at the cost of nearly 900,000 Algerian lives. Political and economic colonialism was coupled with a civilizing and religious mission. One colonial official of the time wrote, quote, the Christian conversion of Algerian Muslims was a duty that Providence had bestowed upon France. The sentiment was shared by Archbishop Al Alamont La Vigerie of Algiers founder of the Missionaries of Africa or the White Fathers, who in 1867 wrote to the governor of Algeria regarding their common enterprise, quote, 
Algeria is the only door opened by Providence on a barbaric continent of 200 million souls. It is especially there that we must bring the Catholic apostolate. The church's aggressive zeal sometimes caused problems for the colonial authority. Bishop Antoine Adolphe du Pouch, his aggressive ecclesial program that included the practice of converting mosques into churches caused great unrest among the local population such that the French colonial authorities finally forced his retirement. Mystic hermit Charles de Foucault pictured here who lived in Algeria from 1901 until his bungled assassination by bandits in 1916 lamented a lack of support from colonial authorities who quote, support and encourage the Muslim religion. By doing this, they are committing a sort of suicide for I must say it, Islam is our enemy. Foucault opposed the systematic exploitation of Algerians for material gain only because this hampered the civilizing mission and conversions. Foucault writes, I suffer as a Frenchman to see the natives not being ruled as they ought. On the contrary, the morally and spiritually inadequate condition of these people is made all the worse by treating them no more as a means of material acquisition. Or if we act according to Foucault, according to our lights, if we civilize instead of exploiting, in 50 years, Algeria, Tunis and Morocco will be an extension of France. If we do not live up to our duty, if we exploit rather than civilize, we will lose everything and the union we have created from these diverse peoples will turn against us. With good reason, Christianity became conjoined with French colonialism in the Muslim imaginary. And this image of Christianity was challenged only by Algerian independence and nationalism. By 1954, the Front Libération Nationale, the FLN, called for an independent Algerian state, beginning a chain of often violent and divisive events that ended temporarily in its 1962 independence. At the time of Algerian independence, only about 20 to 30% of the approximately 1 million European Christians remained in Algeria. French colonial intransigence allied with conservative Catholics in opposing Algerian independence and called for the defense of Christian civilization from the forces of Islam and communism, the two great threats. The discourse of defending the Christian civilization of Algérie Française became one of the major ideological justifications for violent French tactics. In spite of the violent anti-French and anti-Christian discourses and actions of a minority group, such as the Organisation Armée Secrète, Archbishop Duval of Algiers received a friendly note from the leadership of the FLN, affirming that Algerians saw European settlers as, quote, creatures of God, unquote and condemned the actions of the intransigent settler minority. At independence, the Algerian church intentionally distanced itself from French, the French state, opting instead to negotiate with the new Algerian authorities independently of France. Duval's claim that the true Christian attitude toward political changes taking place in France and Algeria was peaceful and nonviolent was met with hostility by the intransigent settlers who gave him the moniker Mohamed Duval. Likewise, the ecclesial program of returning properties confiscated during the colonial regime to the new Algerian state was not universally welcome. The challenge for the church in independent Algeria was to reimagine how both the institutions and practices of Catholicism could function without the settler population at the core of the church and without colonial state power. The Association d'Etudes was established by the Algerian church in June 1962 to assist in the complex process of decolonization of the church that had religious, political, social, and financial implications. According to historian Denise Fontaine, the first step was, quote, a recognition of the church's complicity in the colonial system and an awareness of how they were perceived by the Muslim population they lived among, end quote. Bernard Piquinbono articulated the new mode of presence of the church in Algeria. First, to announce the gospel in a new language while trying to understand Islam. Second, to become a community of service. And third, to contribute to the building of a new state. 
Before becoming an agent of reconciliation, the Church of Algeria worked out its redemption as a witness of love through concrete actions. It was in this context of decolonization and independence that Pierre Clavery returned to Algeria in 1962. Clavery was born on the 8th of May, 1938 in Algiers, Algeria into a Pienoir family, a family of, that is a family of French origin that remained French in culture, language, religion, and nationality, but had been established in Algeria, sometimes for many generations. He lived in what he would later call a colonial bubble that separated Algerian Muslims from European Christian settlers. In reflecting on growing up in colonial Algeria, Clavery writes, I spent my childhood in a colonial bubble. Not that there were no relations between the two worlds, Arab and Muslim and French Catholic, far from that. But in my social milieu, I lived in a bubble, ignorant of the other, not encountering the other except as part of the paysage or the decor that was implanted in my collective existence. The indigenous Algerian was an absent present, rendered an object with no existential value in the colonial bubble imposed by settlers. In his childhood, Clavery says he was taught by the church to love his neighbor, but never that the Arab was his neighbor. The neighbor in the colonial context was someone like oneself. Now, after post-secondary studies in science in Grenoble in France, Clavery entered the order of preachers, the Dominicans, on the 7th of December, 1958. He had first encountered the French Dominicans in the 1950s through his involvement in the scout movement in Algeria, led by French Dominicans. The Dominicans who were in Algeria were members of the French province. He spent the conciliar era, 59 to 67, at their center of formation, the Solchoir, where he was introduced to new historical perspectives and pastoral studies by the likes of M. D. Chenou, Yves Congar, and Pierre Liège. Throughout his time as a student in France, he followed the events that led to the independence of Algeria, often with horror and dismay at the violence, really unsure of where he stood in this complex situation. Clavery returned to Algeria in 1962 to complete his military service as a chaplain. The Algerian War of Independence occasioned an existential crisis that began Clavery's conversion from youthful settler to anti-colonial. The Algerian quest for liberation and independence from France shattered the violence of the colonial bubble that had protected Pierre. Clavery writes, I came to my religious faith in the midst of the Algerian War. How could I have lived in ignorance of this world, which demanded recognition of its identity and dignity? How could I so often have heard the words of Christ about loving the other like myself, like him, and never have met that other, who was popping out like a boogeyman in our little universe? Even after his lifelong involvement in Catholic youth circles, post-secondary education, novitiate, studies of the soul shuar, even religious profession, he only came to his religious faith, he says, in the midst of the crisis of the Algerian war. It was the other, the Algerian, the Arab, the Muslim that demanded recognition of his or her existence, identity and dignity after over a century of their denial. The other who was rendered invisible in the colonial system is suddenly visible, standing before Pierre. In the wake of the self-affirmation of the other, Pierre writes, maybe because of my ignorance of the other or that I denied his existence, one day he jumped in front of my face. He exposed my closed universe that was devolving into violence. But how could it have been otherwise? And he affirmed his existence. Pierre realized that the colonial system that closes in on itself to protect the interests of those with political, social and economic privilege devolves into violence against the other. Upon his assignation to Algeria, to Algeria in 1967, after his preposital ordination in 1965, Clavery began an intense study of Arabic. Arabic had been classified as a foreign language in colonial Algeria in 1930, and along with other local languages like Berber, 
uh, had been displaced by the French in the process of colonial domination. Now, by 1954, 90% of the Muslim population was illiterate. So like other victims of colonization, robbed of language, Pierre set about with them finally learning Arabic. Learning Arabic opened a world of meaning for Clavery. In his address to his Arab friends on the occasion of his Episcopal ordination in 1981, Clavery declared, I owe to you what I am. I lived as a stranger in my youth. With you, studying Arabic, I have above all learned to speak the language of the heart, that of brotherly friendship, where all races and religions commune together. This friendship is deeper than our differences. This friendship comes from God and leads to God. This divine gift of friendship is established through language. Paradoxically, Pierre realizes that in learning the language of the other to communicate, he became acutely aware of the abyss that separates them. Language, experience, culture, religion. The other had power to question the validity of one's own world and at the same time to bestow blessing. Acknowledging the Muslim and Arab context in which he lived, Clavery discovered that there were hundreds of millions of people who lived differently than he, who experienced reality differently than he. Clavery affirmed that each person is, quote, a source that permits one to transgress obstacles, burst bubbles, go toward the other, end quote. The stranger other can become friend, but never the same. The history of colonialism taught Clavery that reality cannot be conceived of singly, but only in the plural. Clavery calls this humanité plurielle, which loses some of its eloquence when we translate it into English as sort of humanity in the plural or, or plural humanity. There is a danger in conceiving language, culture, history, religion, and even humanity in the singular. Clavery writes, to possess the truth or to speak in the name of humanity, we fall into totalitarianism and exclusion. No one possesses the truth. Each one searches for it. Certainly there are objective truths, but they exceed everyone and we cannot access them except in a long journey and in reconstructing little by little a component truth here and there, gleaning from other cultures, other types of humanity, that which others have acquired and discovered in their own journey toward the truth. Clavery recognized the church's entanglement with the colonial complex in imposing a singular vision of truth for humanity. Furthermore, he acknowledged that in Algeria, the church helped to sustain a form of power in which it is difficult even today to distinguish political from religious motives. And so the church, he says, has good reason to remain modest. In spite of the earnest attempts of the Algerian church to repudiate its colonial past and build a new nation in solidarity with indigenous peoples, the violence that plagued the nation infiltrated the small Christian community, beginning with the murders of the Marist Henri Verges and Assumptionist sister Paul Hélène Raymond on the 8th of May, 1994. Clavery did not hide his disappointment writing in the Diocesan Journal that same month. We know very well that there are some who consider us dangerous and harmful, influences of a colonial past and incorrigible enemies of Islam. We continue nonetheless to believe that the trust and friendship of so many Algerians would protect us. But Clavery would become increasingly disappointed for Verges and Saint Raymond were but the first of 19 victims uh, amidst the brutal violence of the Algerian civil war that killed so many, some estimates up to 200,000. There was Henri Verges, who had been in uh, Algeria since 1969 and was a mathematics teacher, murdered along with sister Paul Hélène, who uh, worked with premature babies in Casablanca. Then a few months later on the 23rd of August, 1994, 
two Augustinian missionary sisters were killed on their way to mass, Mira Caridad Martin and Esther Alonso. Alonso, a nurse by pref profession, prioritized helping differently able children. And then just after Christmas, 1994, four white fathers or missionaries of Africa were killed in the courtyard of their mission building. Some had worked there since 1950. Others had been appointed uh, directors of youth hostel. Christian Chassel, so Alain, uh, Charles Decker, Jean Chaviard, Christian Chassel had even made his oath as a white father on the uh, gospel according to St. Luke written in Arabic. In 1995, two sisters of Our Lady of the Apostle were killed after attending mass in Valcourt, Denise Leclerc, who had been in Algeria since 1964, and Jeanne Littlejohn, who ran an orphanage and a boarding school for girls. She remained in, in Algeria, she arrived in Algeria in 1957. And then Odette Prévost, a little sister of the Sacred Heart who had been in Algeria for 26 years was killed as she was heading to mass. And finally, and famously, the Trappists from Mount uh, Atlas in Tibrine, Algeria were killed. Their story was made famous by that powerful movie, uh, many of you might have seen it, of gods and men. Christian de Cherge, who was part of the convent from 1984, he had had a life-changing encounter in his life when he was saved by a Muslim father of 10 children in 1959 while Der Cherge was doing his military service. Paul Dossier, a, a doctor. Christophe Le Breton, who had made his profession in at Mount Atlas. Michel Fleury, Christian Le Marchand, Celestin Reignard. All of them, all of these people present in Algeria and present to the people. And none of them had sort of an evangelizing mission. They were involved in social service and justice works. As the violence escalated, Clavery became increasingly vocal against radical Islam and its singularity of religious, political, and linguistic expression that had infected Algeria. Uh, the problem obviously for Clavery isn't Islam. It's a singular vision that's imposed violently. He regularly spoke against the situation of violence and oppression in the diocesan newsletters. In 1996, the French publishing house Les Editions du Cerf published a collection of his letters and articles and subsequently, um, Clavery embarked on a rather successful book tour in France. While some accused the Bishop of imprudence for speaking so openly and publicly during such a sensitive period, he responded, quote, I cannot remain silent. What I can do is witness to the truth. End quote. In an interview with TV, with TV France 2, Clavery said, I'm taking the risk because I want to emphasize the relationships of solidarity that we have sought and established over decades are still important to us at this time of deepening crisis among cultures and religions. This time of marginalization and exclusion. So then he said, we intend to communicate a message of peace by the simple fact of our existence. Clavery often used the word uh, dial, uh, uh, solidarity instead of dialogue. Though he was on the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue and involved in many formal dialogues, he, he, he really didn't like the word. The word that he used to refer to his relationship with Muslims was solidarity and friendship. The morning of August 1st, 1996, Bishop Clavery traveled to the capital Algiers to speak to the French foreign minister who was visiting Algeria to discuss the safety of French citizens resident there in the face of escalating violence. In addition to civilian casualties of the conflict, journalists, foreigners, Christian missionaries had been targeted. Already 18 Roman Catholic religious were either murdered or missing since May 8, 1994. But Clavery reiterated his position and that of many others like him who refused to leave France in spite of the deteriorating situation. For Clavery, just one person, like his friend Mohammed, made it worth staying. In that movie of Gods and Men, the community discerns whether they're gonna stay or leave. And, and that's a, a really important moment in the film. You know, they say, nobody wants to die. Right? We're not cultivating as they might've in the 15th or 16th century, a desire to die like Christ, but we wanna be here and present in solidarity with our friends. 
that day on August 1st, while in Algiers, Claver took advantage of his time to visit with some nostalgia the neighborhood of his childhood. After finally securing a flight in the evening, he flew back to Oran with some of his friends and was collected at the airport by his friend Mohammed. Upon entering the Episcopal residence, a bomb detonated, killing the two men. Two more victims of a war that lasted until 2002 and saw anywhere, estimates have, between 44,000 and 200,000 people killed, the vast majority Algerian Muslims. Muhammad, the 21-year-old Muslim, always remembered the great generosity of a women's community in his childhood that had helped his family and was so happy to be of service to the small Christian community in Oran. Just prior to his assassination, he wrote in his diary a last testament of sorts. Clearly, it was written by somebody who knew he was facing death. In it, he professes God merciful and asks forgiveness of anyone he may have offended and to be remembered for the good he has done. I'll now read the testament in full. In the name of God, the merciful, before raising my pen, I say to you, peace be with you. I thank whoever is going to read my notebook, and I say to everyone I have known in my life that I thank them. I say they will be rewarded by God on the last day. Farewell to the one I would to the one I would have hurt, forgive me. Pardon him who will forgive me on the day of judgment. And whoever I hurt, may he forgive me. Pardon anyone who heard a mean word from my mouth. And I ask all my friends to forgive me because of my youth. But on this day that I write to you, I remember what I have done right in my life. May God in his omnipotence make me submit to him and grant me his tenderness. Together, Mohammed and Pierre witnessed to what dialogue looks like, solidarity and friendship that risks even death. If refusing to leave the country to be in solidarity with the victims of the civil war and speaking out against violence as a Christian perceived as a foreigner was a risk for Clavery, merely being a friend to Pierre was the risk Mohammed took. I'm going to begin now part two of this talk. And I start with thinking about holiness in a world church. Clavery's lifespan, it's probably life spans the tradition, the, the transition, sorry, <clears throat> from post from colonialism to post-colonialism and even anti-colonialism. His witness to holiness in a post-colonial context began with his recognition of the sinfulness of colonialism that erased and alienated the other. Further, Clavery was converted to the other and the world of the other, as evidenced in his long engagement in learning Arabic. He eschewed the single normative understanding of culture, society, religion, and even the human. His critique of Christian forms of colonialism was echoed in his rejection of the imperialism of radical Islam. Clavery led a church that embraced its lack of state power on the fault lines of humanity in solidarity with the victims of history. For the Algerian church, this was a transition from a church with a civilizing mission to a church with a listening mission, a church of privilege to a church of vulnerability, a church of power to a church of nonviolence, a church that imposed a language to a church that learned a new language. The shift represents a significant change from a previous era in the Roman Catholic Church's relationship to Muslims, to power, to truth, and to history. Now, Karl Rahner identifies three epochs in the history of the church. The first brief epoch was the proclamation of the Kerygma in its original Jewish and Semitic context. It ended with the Council of Jerusalem that began the expansion of the church into the Gentile world, right, into the Greek speaking world. And this long epoch lasted until the mid 20th century. It encompassed the global extension of European mercantile and political interests across the continents through conquest, imperialism, and colonization. And during this epoch, a single normative culture, Western European and religion, Christianity was exported and imposed on colonized people throughout the world. Latin America, South America, Asia, Africa, etc. 
The third and current epoch of the church, Rahner terms the world church. The second Vatican council marks the Roman Catholic church's first attempt to understand and actualize itself into a world church. The council was global, but not monolithic. It was multinational, multicultural, multilinguistic. An awareness of the pluricentrality of the church is evidenced in the displacement of Latin by vernacular languages for liturgy, for instance, or the authority of the local church and its bishop. The declaration of the beatification uh, of the martyrs of Algeria calls them faithful messengers of the gospel, humble artisans of peace, remarkable witnesses of Christian charity. Indeed, they were. Additionally, though, I argue the beatification has novel significance that reflects specific historical, a specific historical and cultural situation. Calvary's life and beatification are emblematic of the emergence of a new way of being church, a shift from the second to the third epoch, from a colonial to a post-colonial paradigm. Now, a word on beatification, I think it's important. Beatification or canonization is an authoritative statement of who and what the church believes to be holy. In beatifying or canonizing someone, the church imposes upon the faithful the liturgical commemoration of the person, whether regionally in those that are beatified, the blessed, or universally, right? Saints' days that are in the universal calendar. And it is the result of an in-depth process of investigation and study at the local and universal levels. Some theologians and canonists argue that this process um, uh, would have, uh, the implications of this process constitute a form of infallible teaching, beatification and canonization. And today I'm using the term rather fluidly, beatification and canonization to refer to the martyrs because martyrs do not need a, a miracle to be canonized. So I'm using it fluidly. And as heroic as the death of a martyr may be, the martyr is remembered not only for his death or her, her death or the manner by which the person died, but also for the integrity of the life he or she led in the face of the real possibility of death as a consequence. On the significance of saints, Karl Rahner says this, saints are the initiators and the creative models of the holiness which happens to be right for and is the task of their particular age. They create a new style. They prove that a certain form of life and activity is a real genuine possibility. They show experimentally that one can be Christian, even in this way. They make a certain type of person believable as a Christian type. Their significance begins therefore not merely after they are dead. Their death is rather the seal put on their task of being creative models, a task which they had in the church during their lifetime and their living on means that the example they have given remains in the church as a permanent form. For Lawrence Cunningham, saints often break with current understandings and practices of the faith because the, quote, modes of doing things do not seem to be sufficient for the cultural conditions, end quote. The blessed testify to the possibility of sanctity germane to their time and an example that stands historically as an enriching paradigm for the future. Clavery and companions witness to, a, to new modes of relations appropriate to the post-colonial condition of Algeria and open us up to future perspectives because they're rooted in actual relationships that are organic. Now, I'm gonna to turn to the, I see some questions. Okay. Bear with me, I'm, I'm a Luddite at heart, so. Are you wanting to, to take the question now? And yeah. um, maybe why don't I take a look at the question? Maybe that's okay. Good. It's a long one. That's right. <laughs> the struggle for power uh, between the parties who see themselves in equal status circles is a source of resentment. How can the cat? I'll get to the. Um, how can the Catholic Church act in solidarity with others so as not to foment resent resentment and allow God to act through those who are allowed agency? Okay, let me come. Let me complete a bit of this part because I, I think that. 
we have some suggestions in, in what I'm going to show you and in the words of, the, of Pope Francis, and then we'll come back to that question. Thank you for the question. On December 8th, uh, on December 8th, 2018, Pierre Clavery and his 18 martyred companions were beatified in an open air liturgy in the brilliant afternoon sun in the coastal city of Oran, Algeria. The beatification liturgy, like Pierre himself, witnessed to a new type of encounter, solidarity and friendship. Before the beatification, relatives of the beatified were received by Muslim dignitaries at the, at the Grand Mosque, where Imam Mustafa Jabir welcomed guests saying, quote, we Muslims associate this event with much joy. These Christian martyrs killed during this national tragedy had a good mission. They were determined to spread peace. According to Jean-Francois Bourg, several features of the beatification liturgy are themselves, are themselves worth noting. First, it marks the first time a beatification was celebrated in a Muslim nation. There was the noticeable presence of Muslims, religious and civic leaders who occupied at least one third of the space. Has there ever been a beatification liturgy with such an impressive uh, presence of Muslims? Second, Jean-Paul Vesco, the current Bishop of Oran and successor to Pierre Clavery, who you see at the anvil right now, opened the liturgy in his diocese with the voice of the other by reading from Muhammad's last testament. So the words of a Muslim friend set the tone for the liturgy, the voice of Muhammad witnessing to mercy and forgiveness. And sitting in the crowd in the assembly were Pierre Clavery's sister and Muhammad's mother sitting side by side. Next, after the, after the papal declaration was read, let me go to that point. Uh, now, as is the tradition, after the papal declaration was read, the banner containing the portraits and names of the newly beatified was unfurled. Amongst the sea of traditional Algerian names written in blue, which we'll see in a moment, you can see it uh, here, it's about to be unfurled. Amongst the sea of name, traditional Algerian names written in blue and Arab and Latin script, representing the countless victims of the civil war, were 20 names written in blood red. Those are the 19 Christian martyrs, but also that of their Muslim companion, Muhammad. Martyr avec un choix qui a été fait d'inscrire de nombreux prénoms, y compris des, des prénoms et peut-être d'abord des prénoms classiques du peuple algérien. Et rouge ressortent les prénoms de ces 19 martyrs qui sont ainsi mêlés aux autres. En rouge aussi, le prénom de Mohamed, le chauffeur de Monseigneur Clavry et son ami, nous l'avons entendu, dont la maman est présente dans l'Assemblée et qui a été tuée en même temps que lui. Les voilà donc proclamés bienheureux. And I kept it until you, you can even hear the jubilation of the people present, which is a sign, a very traditional sign in Algeria. Now, last is the exchange of peace. It's 211. The exchange of peace, the sign of unity exchanged after the recitation of the Lord's Prayer and before partaking the Paschal Sacrifice of Christ, the apex of the celebration of the moment when Jesus gives himself generously into the hands of hatred and violence for the sake of the world. This sign is shared not just by the Christians who will receive communion, but with the Muslims present. The communion peace of the baptized becomes a sign of universal peace. There you see the sister of Clavery and his mother of Muhammad in red. While rooted in the deep, in the depth of the Christian tradition, this post-colonial liturgy was emblematic of a new moment of encounter, solidarity and friendship with the other. I wanna conclude now with, the, with by changing gears a bit 
and maybe and looking at some current teachings, and that is to look at the Pope's most recent encyclical, Fratelli Tutti. I think it gives us some real air, some real uh, avenues for reflection on Pierre Claverie and on what a dialogue might look like today. In his greeting to the people assembled for the beatification in 2018, Pope Francis has wished that the beatification of Claverie and companions, quote, be an incentive for all to build a world of fraternity and solidarity together. These two themes were recently expressed in his own 2020 encyclical, fittingly entitled, On Fraternity and Social Friendship, or On Siblinghood and Social Friendship. The encyclical is inspired by the common document on human fraternity, co-signed by the Pope and the Grand Imam Ahmed Al-Tayeb, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar in Egypt, and the head of the Al-Azhar Mosque and University. This was signed in 2019. In the encyclical, Imam Ahmed Al-Tayeb is referred to five times in the document and credited with being a source of encouragement for it. Al-Tayeb's description is not dissimilar to the inspiration that the Orthodox Patriarch Bartholomew provided for Pope Francis' encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si. This is very significant for two reasons. Never before has a Muslim been credited with assisting the church in developing its teaching and right, shaping its worldview. And he is cited within the text at least five times. Secondly, Francis's encyclical is not only the product of theological and social analyses, but the fruit of his fraternal relations with Imam Al-Tayyab. The encyclical is a performative artifact. It is itself the result of interfaith, solidarity, and friendship. The word solidarity appears 26 times in the encyclical. Without recovering a deep sense of true solidarity, that is beyond acts of kindness and generosity or charity, Francis warns that many will be left in the grip of anguish and emptiness. For Francis, solidarity is born out of the consciousness that we are responsible for the fragility of others as we strive to build a common future, responsible for the fragility of others. Thus solidarity is not simply the common good, building up the common good, that could be utilitarian, but a responsibility for the fragility, the vulnerability and the weaknesses of the other. And Francis says something really interesting about this type of solidarity. He says, solidarity understood in its most profound meaning is a way of making history. So what moves history forward isn't technological development or economic growth or medical innovation as important as they are, but taking responsibility for the fragility of others, the poor, the marginalized, the excluded, those without voice. The word fraternity appears 55 times in the document and friendship another 22. Drawing inspiration from the narrative of the Good Samaritan in Luke's gospel account, Francis describes the process of border transgressing. The Samaritan became a neighbor to the wounded Judean. By approaching and making himself present, he crossed all cultural and historical barriers. That's number 81 of Fratelli Tutti. True friendship, writes Francis, can only take root in hearts open to growth through relationships with others. As couples or friends, we find that our hearts expand as we step out of ourselves and embrace others. Closed groups and self-absorbed couples that define themselves in opposition to others tend to be expressions of selfishness and mere self-preservation. Expanding our circle of friends beyond those we consider our natural or obvious circle expands our areas of interest and concern. Transcending, transgressing these borders is what Francis means by social friendship. The alternative to social friendship is, quote, closed groups and self-absorbed couples that define themselves in opposition to others and tend to be expressions of selfishness and mere self-preservation, end quote. Closed groups are motivated solely by self-interest, but this ends in despair 
This ends in the sense that nothing can be fixed. Everything remains the same. Quote, quoting Francis now, plunging people into despair closes a perfectly perverse circle. Such is the hidden is the agenda of the invisible dictatorship of hidden interests that have gained mastery over both resources and the possibility of thinking and expressing opinions. If you recall, Clavery was aware of the direction that self-enclosure led to, right? He said this, this uh, despair, uh, Clavery wrote, led to violence against the other in the attempt to protect one's self-interest. Not unaware of the reality of violence and the victims of history and the need to remember correctly, Francis writes, and I quote a rather long paragraph. The victims themselves, individuals, social groups or nations need to remember the past lest they succumb to the mindset that leads to justifying reprisals and every kind of violence in the name of the great evil endured. For this reason, I think not only of the need to remember the atrocities, but also all those who amid such great inhumanity and corruption retained their dignity and with gestures small or large, chose the part of solidarity, forgiveness and fraternity. To remember goodness is also a healthy thing. It's a paragraph that could be directly applied to the 19 martyrs and to Muhammad. This is after all what Muhammad asks for at the end of his testament when he says, remember what I have done right in my life. Solidarity and friendship cultivate a culture of encounter. In an age of culture wars and walls, digital, metaphorical, physical, that divide and isolate, Francis makes a clarion call to dialogue. Dialogue draws us out of ourselves and our limited circle of friends toward concern for the other. This orientation to the other is what makes us human. Francis writes a fairly strong anthropological statement. Human beings are so made that they cannot live, develop and find fulfillment except in sincere gift of self to others. Nor can they fully know themselves apart from an encounter with other persons. Dialogue entails the ability to recognize other people's right to be themselves and to be different. This recognition, as it becomes a culture, makes possible the creation of a social covenant. This is what Clavery termed humanity in the plural. What the Pope names as the culture of encounter contains processes of encounter, processes that build a people that can accept differences. Far from ignoring differences, a culture of encounter recognizes them. Quoting 143 of Fratelli Tutti, Francis says, I cannot truly encounter another unless I stand on firm foundations. For it is on the basis of these that I can accept the gift the other brings and in turn offer an authentic gift of my own. I can welcome others who are different and value the unique contribution they have to make only if I am firmly rooted in my own people and culture. Francis imagines society as a polyhedron, quote, where differences exist, coexist, complementing, enriching, and reciprocally illuminating one another, even amid disagreements and reservations, end quote. The polyhedron image celebrates the distinctiveness and uniqueness of each and every one as they are and the gifts they bring to the community in human solidarity and friendship. To conclude then, what I've tried to demonstrate today, tonight, is that a Catholic perspective on dialogue is informed by the witness of a creative minority, not afraid to confront the reality of history and rooted in concrete practices and commitments. This witness is not limited to them, for they provide a model for all Christians today. The story of Pierre Clavery and Mohammed is the memory not only of violent death, but more importantly, their powerful witness to solidarity and friendship in the face of great risk. These dual vectors, solidarity and friendship, shape the Catholic perspective on relationships with other religions as we step into a church, 
perched on the threshold of a post-colonial world. Thank you. And I'll look at the question now. I'll read the question, which was a bit longer. And if there's more questions, please uh, send them in. So this is from Paul Terrio. The struggle for power between parties who see themselves in equal status circles is a source of resentment for the overpowered party. Anyone who agrees to act in a power struggle sees themselves as justified in their own power, who must either act against the other to regain status or live in resentment-filled dehumanizing separation. How can the Catholic Church act in solidarity with others so as not to promote resentment and allow God to act through those through those are allowed agency? Paul, thanks for your question. I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand it, so you might have to type in a bit of a clarification. But let me uh, take an example, you know, the, of our situation in Canada. When I was uh, writing this and I was thinking about the post-colonial context, and I really think post-colonial insights are important for how we relate to other religions and how post-colonialism shapes our, our dialogues. I, you know, the irony of speaking about Algeria in a, in a country like Canada where we we have a history of colonialism to confront ourselves, wasn't lost on me. So in this particular case of Canada, I, I think about how, what, what, what Clavery's story might look like in Canada, right? if we were to model it, you know, would we be ready to learn first, language, first Nations languages, for example, in order to communicate? Can we recognize, and I think that certainly the state has through the TRC, the uh, damage of colonialism and our, our part in it. Do First Nations people, do Indigenous people remain almost absent in our worldview? So I, I, I wonder, and sort of maybe applying your question, uh, if we can do it in, in sort of at the particular ways and in the particular context in which we live. But I don't know if that answers the, the question. Um, Paul, is there anything that you'd like to clarify? You could just type that in there as well. <laughs> Sometimes short, um, pithy um, <laughs> questions are good as well versus uh, long paragraphs. Uh, we can uh, elaborate as needed. I, why don't we... Um, for now, we can move to the next question, and if Paul wants to elaborate, we can uh, we can do that. Okay. So Anne uh, asks: Is the distinction between solidarity and dialogue is understood by Pierre Clavery uh, necessary for today? If so, does the exploration of this distinction have the potential to further assist interreligious dialogue? Thanks for that question. I uh, I think there is a bit of a distinction because sometimes dialogue is seen um, as an exchange of information, you know, and it, and it is a conversation, and it is um, sometimes it's it's up to the realm of professionals, you know, who sit around and say, what topic are we going to dialogue? We see this with ecumenical dialogues where there's a topic like Christology or 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 um, scripture that that we speak about you know, the different views on this. So dialogue uh, takes on a really an, an ex a language exchange uh, dimension and it's often oriented towards maybe producing a document or something like that or a social project. Solidarity is more at the realm of, of living, of human living, of being with people who are different and sort of trying to figure out your way forward. It doesn't exclude dialogue because of course language is necessary. But I think the type of thing that Pierre was uh, nervous about was to say that our relationships with other, with the religiously other are mediated through these types of formal dialogues that don't take into account what's really important. And that's to be friends, you know, to be friends with, with the Muslim or a Jewish neighbor, to stand in solidarity with people who are suffering together. So I think that's the distinction that he makes between dialogue and solidarity. Um, I see that uh, Paul is, has just added, I think, an elaboration to his question. He says, BIPOC initiatives 
describe a, a deep resentment that is difficult to overcome without the use of power. So how, I think it's how can we move beyond power? Um, if that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I suppose it depends how you want to think about power. I think there's different ways to think about power. Uh, I think power for Pierre and Mohammed was in their friendship. And, and in some ways, it witnessed to a power greater than right, those who had killed them. So I think it depends on how you can, how, I think part of this is how you think about power and how people conceive of power. Power is not just a single, a single thing. It can be understood and used and shared in so many different ways. It can be used to empower as much as it can be used to oppress. Um, so uh, Ma Matt jo Matthew George uh, asks if singular expression is the problem, how is it being expressed in the Muslim community? So who is their enlightened minority? Do you see any ways that this will percolate into the political sphere? How do the I think, Shiite and uh, Shia regimes interpret this question? Uh, so I, I would be careful I'd not, I'd that I don't, I don't speak for the Muslim community. And, and I don't, so I don't, I can't answer the question because I think here to be fair, you would need a, a Muslim to answer. Um, I'm not sure if the singular expression is the problem. The singularity of language, the imposition of a singular worldview is the problem. If I'm understanding the question correctly. So I, I could say that, you know, for, for, for Muslims diversity including religious diversity, is actually willed by God. It's in the Quran. So, so in, 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 in this sense, uh, they have a sense of plurality already. Now, um, who the creative minority is, I'm not sure. I meet many of them. I meet many creative minority, uh, many creative Muslims in, in these dialogues as we try to build social projects and whatnot. So I don't know exactly how to name them, but I know I met them. Yeah. So, and and I can give you later the the reference to the Quran that where diversity where we see that oh there it is, um, verse forty eight. If God wanted, and I'm reading from the the a quote from the Quran. If if God had wanted it, God would have made you one community, but God wanted uh, to to. I'm sorry, it's not in English. So, uh, God wanted to test you by the gift of diversity that He gave you. It's all the more impressive for translating on the spot. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, okay, Jillian Balfour um, asks, uh, it seems that uh, individuals embody reconciliation representation. Does the state have a role, for example, the TRC, or um, are individuals who act through transgression, et cetera, as possibly more important in post-colonialism? I would say that one is not more important than the other. I think that individuals have responsibilities. I absolutely think the state has responsibility. Uh, uh, absolutely, and, and in the case of the TRC, a state that benefits from the settlement of this uh, land. And I think that communities and organizations have responsibility. And in this context, I, I would say to, to think about how the church responds uh, to some of the calls to action. The, it's very interesting, in the 1960s, the Church of Algeria really collectively took an option, the bishops and the Catholics there, to divest themselves of power and privilege, to, to stay on the side of the vulnerable and the poor. That was an option, a collective option of the church. So I think that, as the, and that embodies, that embodied reconciliation also, that made possible uh, people's individual commitments so I don't think it's an either or. I think it, it's uh, at the level of individuals and, and, and organizations and certainly in the case of Canada, the state uh, uh, through things like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, through um, uh, privileging, you know, I work in university through privileging studies, indigenous studies, et cetera. It's hard to know if I've answered questions because I can't see, I wish I could see you all. Maybe you would be nodding or maybe you would be, uh, scowling, but it would give me an indication. So I'm hoping I'm at least touching on an answer here. 
But if I haven't, then just pop back into that box and let me know. Please, yeah, yeah. If there is ever a need for some clarification, please do uh, do type it in. Um, because uh, yes, because we're going to give Paul another shot here. <laughs> okay, so um, how can we move beyond power struggles when power seems to be the default reaction to power? I have to say, I'm, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not sure. I'm just not sure I understand the question. Yeah. I mean, it, in some sense, somebody has to not react in that way. I mean, if this is just a question of power struggles or just power reacting to power, then you're trapped in a cycle of, of violence. You're trapped in a cycle of something. Um, so I think that, um, I, I think at, at, at some point, uh, you have to decide consciously to move out, step outside of that circle beyond a certain understanding of power. But Okay. So we'll put that. So, so Jillian uh, follows up here. So I'm just struck by the power and the beauty of humanity in the video clip uh, between the individuals, uh, the importance of human connection. Uh, thank you for your answer. And, and, and he is, she is nodding. <laughs> Affirmation. So if you feel like watching it long, the adification, it is worth watching because it's, you know, it's not a triumphant, you know, you think of the ones at St. Peter's now, of course, they're done locally more often now, but, you know, they're usually done in sort of impressive cathedrals and with a, 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 a powerful choir and an organ and music. And this was really quite simple. It was very, very simple, um, quite humble. There was a sense of interaction between the people who were clearly of different faiths. The families of the uh, martyrs were present, you know, and they had become themselves friends. Uh, Clavery's sister and the mother of Muhammad remain in contact, right? So this, and, and they remain concerned for one another. So this uh, solidarity and friendship of Pierre and Muhammad have moved beyond them. Right? They've, it's, it's sort of multiplied and expanded into different networks. And I think that the, 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 the liturgy reflects that. And, and I think that what's important about the liturgy and those four or five unique features of it is, I mean, this is when the church is most church. The church is most church when it is at prayer and its liturgy assembled around the altar. So the identity of the church isn't, in this case, isn't separated from Arab Muslims. Right. It's most church. We're most who we are in that beatification liturgy, in, in, in our interaction and our friendship with those who are different. I think that's why it's a powerful testament to who we are or who we can be as a church, because this is an official liturgy. This is a beatification liturgy. Okay. So there aren't other questions in the... Uh, um chat now, but please uh, continue to, uh, we've got some time, so, uh, you know, do uh, try to articulate something, uh, folks. Um, what, I, I, I want to just follow up on what, what Paul was talking about, I think, I didn't want to put words in his mouth, okay, um, but I just, uh, I wonder if what he's, what he's getting at is that our, kind of our default seems to be conflict, right, it seems to be power um, uh, versus power, right, so we get entrenched in certain ways. But I wonder what what in your in your study you might um, have found that um, allowed people or empowered people to take a different path. Okay, so I think that path of peace and friendship and dialogue. Um, that is there kind of a a secret ingredient there that that maybe <laughs> is worth elaborating on a little bit more. Yeah, I think that um, the conflict arises 
in, in this, in, in what I was talking about, because circles become closed, right? You have Arab Muslims with a, with a singular uh, imposition of a vision of, because the radical Islam that infected Algeria during the civil war uh, probably came from outside of Algeria. And it, it didn't take the diversity of Islam or the diversity of the Algerian people seriously. Closed, self-referential, possessing the truth. But, you know, in colonial times, same as Pierre said, it lives in a colonial bubble. And, but this bubble, this self-referential um, grouping leads to violence because you need to protect your interests somehow. You need to protect your interests and in that if you're your neighbor who is actually somebody who's just like you. Both Pierre and also what the Pope say, you know, it's an opening, it's in, it's in that bubble bursting. Now for Clavery, it burst. Now, maybe in some cases it bursts, in some cases we can open it as the Pope suggests. And I, in any case, that closed circle can't remain closed because then you have those circles bumping up against each other and that's the conflict, right? And then, so actually in opening this circle, in extending a hand of friendship, that's, that avoids the conflict, right? So the, 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 the more closed in we become, the more convinced we are that there is one way and we have it, the greater, the, the greater um, the chance that there will be that type of conflict. So I think it's good. We've got to, uh, we've got to transgress the borders like the Good Samaritan. We've got to, and, and that, and that does take effort. It does take effort, but sometimes it, it, it doesn't take effort. Like it's not, you know, like Sisyphus. It's just moving out of your comfort zone because what you discover is you discover the other. You discover the other, you discover the beauty of the other. And as the Pope says, and, and you realize who you are in that. Like we can't even be ourselves if we're not open to the other. And so there's the issue of conflict and power, but you can't even be who you are without the other. You're sort of stuck in your own solipsistic world. And so dialogue with other religions for Catholics actually helps us to be who we, who we are, who we're called to be. Like it makes us truer to our own selves. Thank, thank you for that. And, uh, and thank you for, to Jennifer, who's asking a question for us here. So Jennifer do, uh, says, do you have an idea of how the concept of reparation fits into our call for reconciliation? And do you have suggestions about how to go about reparation work as a church? Um, so also, what are some ways that Christian church congregations can build relationships with one another and with other faiths? There's a lot there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, this isn't, a, this maybe won't be such a popular answer for the Catholics, but uh, of which I am one. You know, uh, I think the church, certainly the Catholic church has work to do here. Um, because of the structure of the church uh, and in terms of who is financially responsible, it's a bit more complicated because we're not a single corporation like the United Church of Canada or the Anglican Church of Canada. So different dioceses, different religious communities, different levels of uh, complicity and, and act, act, active complicity in, um, for instance, the residential schools. One of the calls to action is about uh, establishing a fund establishing a fund for uh, Indigenous education projects. Now, like that fund hasn't been topped up yet, but I do see the church spending a lot of money on other things, not just like, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, millions, cathedrals, seminaries, buildings, like it's a lot of money. So, you know, I, when you ask the question about reparation, and our work as a church, I, I, it's a big question mark for me, and, and it's a bit, it's a bit of a, a sad thing. Now, I'm not saying that I get this legal ramifications and all these kinds of things, but at, at some basic level, you think, well, if there's money for these things, 
if there's money for other things, is is the uh, is the financial uh, responsibility toward First Nations is that a priority or not for the church? And when I say the church, I don't just mean the bishops because it's all of us, right? And, and we have some kind of financial stake in it. So I would I would like to see um, I would like to see the, the 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 calls to action better fulfilled by by the Catholic Church. How do you go about it? Uh, that I don't know. Um, that I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm a religious. I don't even have a bank account. But I'm assuming that many people who go to church have bank accounts and give money. And that might be a way to, is thinking about where you put your money. You know, so the priority of the church, um, so not just the bishops, but also people. Uh, people can decide where they what what organizations they give to that are worthy and and if if a decolonization and if um, reparation is important it might be more important than giving to I'll use the example of the university it might be more more important than giving to a fund at the university I say that because I work at the university I don't want to put anybody else in the spot so you know that might you might say like actually um, a chair in systematic theology in Interreligious dialogue, that's my area. That's not actually not as important as uh, money for that will help build First Nations communities. I think um, Mo is more giving, uh, Mo Lassert is uh, giving some uh, uh, kind of continuing that dialogue a little bit that, uh, but he's suggesting things like reaching out based upon friendship, take the time to get to know Muslim, Jews, well as other Christian denominations, Start by taking the time to find what we have in common, respect one another. I, yeah. Thanks, Maurice. I think that's right on. You know, I went to a Catholic school. At some point, I started in Catholic school, probably grade four. And then I went to a Catholic college and a Catholic university, and I live in a, you know, a religious community. I remember one day thinking to myself, and I, I had more, I, I had friends who were Jewish and Muslim before I started in Catholic school, because it was a, one of those Montessori schools. I thought to myself one day as an adult, like, I don't really have that many friends who are not Catholic. I live in a, a very um, bordered, small Catholic world. And I think that's the case of many people. I think it's actually the case of Catholics, pro probably because of our school system, I don't know. But um, uh, one thing to see, yeah, it's it's interesting to say, you know, do I have a circle of friends? And this is the type of thing that the Pope is talking about in Fratelli Tutti, that's wider than just people like me. It's so easy to be in those circles of people like me where we're comfortable, might be our job, our religious community, like it makes sense to be in those circles. It's not wrong to be in those circles. But you think in, in cities diverse as like London, like, how, do you know the Jewish people on your street? Or do congregations know Right, we sometimes you have a, a synagogue and a church on the same street. Do they know one another? Not just the, the leaders of the congregations, but actually the people. So I think getting to know people, uh, as you say, reaching out in friendship, is one way, and the other way is a solidarity uh, in uh, in in justice projects. These, I think, really bring people together and, and can really be appreciated. I know when there was violence against the Muslim community in Toronto, they started these ring circles. Of friendship circles well what they did is the christians and jews would surround the mosque on friday at prayer as a sign of support to say you know in, because there was a real fear of violence right you have people who live in this city and probably other cities too in the wake of mounting violence against muslims were thinking well i wonder if i go to when i go to pray today something might happen to me what a strange feeling i've, I've never felt that so uh, primarily Muslim, uh, Jews and Christians got together and they surrounded the mosque as a ring and said, you know, uh, we're here to help protect you and to say to people, if you do anything to our Muslim brothers and sisters, we're in it too. And the same thing, the same thing had happened when there was incidents of anti-Semitic violence also. Uh, Christians and Muslims got together and would surround the, um, the synagogue before, uh, before Shabbat. So, there's plenty of opportunities for, and easy opportunities for, for reaching out in friendship and also in solidarity. 
Yeah, um, oh, there is some. <laughs> And, and Mo's just following up when I was a kid, all my neighbors and friends were all white French Canadians. Now my neighborhood is very diverse and God tells me love, love God and love your neighbors. Yeah. Um, it, so so I, I'm just thinking about what Clavery said too though. It's, yeah. it's, we can almost sometimes select our neighbors. You know, Clavery says, they told me to love my neighbor. They just didn't tell me like the Arab was also my neighbor. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Father Michael uh, says, thank you for uh, being here for your presentation. As someone who's far more engaged in dialogue than any of us in the room, are there signs of hope that you can point to at either a national or international level? Thank you for the question, Father Bashard. I think there are uh, many signs of hope. Um, there's sort of these high level dialogues and relationships that are, are life-giving. Um, I think the encyclical Fratelli Tutti is an example. It's very hopeful. I mean, I don't think uh, Pius, I don't think anyone would, have, would imagine Pius XII quoting an imam in order to shape Catholic papal teaching. This is a real breakthrough. Um, I think of the uh, peace initiatives, right? The Pope inviting um, Palestinian and Israeli leaders to the Vatican for prayer. For prayer. I think those prayers for peace in Assisi are also excellent examples, really hopeful. This is a real, this is probably the most significant development since Vatican II. Vatican II didn't even envision that we could pray together. Right? To sit, and, and that's a powerful thing that we sit and pray together in the internationally, but also nationally. Nationally, I have to admit, you know, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops puts a lot of time, effort, and you can always tell when they're committed, money into dialogues. Uh, I was on the Hindu Catholic dialogue and it's, it's harder, it's easier for Catholics to die because we're so centralized. Catholics have a central, uh, centralized structure that makes it easier. You know, who, who's the dialogue partner for the Catholics? Well, CCCB. It'd be different for Hindus or Muslims or Jews to an extent. So it was, it was bringing Hindus in from all over the country. There was no real structure. There wasn't any money. It was the, the bishop said, no, we're going to support this. We'll take the lead. We'll commit the resources. So I think at the national level there, it, for Catholics, there's lots of signs. I hope there's many interesting dialogues going on. There's the dialogue with the Hindu community. There's the uh, working group with the imams. There's the dialogue with the uh, rabbinic caucus of Canada. And there's two working groups, one Jewish working group, ecumenical working group and with Jews and one ecumenical working group with Muslims. So there's lots of these conversations going on. Then at local levels, I also see quite a bit, um, a bit of uh, activity. So I, I think there are signs of hope. I think there's also maybe um, that we also have to be cautious because we could uh, sometimes these dialogues can be instrumentalized to um, further political motives that's always a bit of my fear is that sometimes the instru instrumentalization um, of these dialogues or of these relationships for a certain political gain okay um, I'm just going to bring myself onto the screen here. I think we've come to the uh, the end of the, the night. Um, one of the things I, I would just like to say is that if you were with us in, in person, you would have the chance to kind of look out over the room and, and quite often, especially for this uh, lecture, which is sponsored by the Center for, for um, <laughs> uh, Jewish Catholic Muslim learning um, that it um, uh, that that we would have quite a diverse uh, community uh, and and we'd be able to kind of witness that a little bit. Um, one of the things that um, that I thought about as you're talking about friendship is, um, for instance, is the um, uh, peace camp that we have here every uh, summer, and we just try to uh, to start with that idea of introducing young people to the idea that we can be friends and dialogue and talk with each other um, at a very uh, 
uh, young age when when people are much more open <laughs> to to learning and uh, so uh, just to kind of uh, bring that to the discussion as well i'd like to thank you for your uh, your talk this evening um, i think that uh, in particular what struck me um, was that uh, that sense of humility and vulnerability that is the necessary precursor to solidarity <laughs> and friendship and dialogue and uh, that you uh, drew that out um, that without the vulnerability and the humility of the, the, those who were uh, involved um, we wouldn't have the witness and uh, and so to be able to 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 see that transformation of the other into a brother or sister uh, it was really quite uh, uh, powerful i agree with uh, with uh, uh, dr balfour uh, that uh, the uh, the um, images from the uh, the mass of beatification were very powerful especially as if as you as you pointed out the community that was present there so thank you so much for uh, being with us and and sharing that uh, this evening um, if everyone was able to they would now join me in a round of applause and uh, so thank you so much for for joining us this evening um, and thank you to all who uh, have attended um, and on March 4th, uh, we will uh, welcome our, our last lecture for this year. And this is uh, from, a, from a Dominican place, Aquinas Institute in uh, St. Louis. Uh, another, uh, Anne, but Anne Garrido, who is not a Dominican, but uh, a, a fine uh, speaker and uh, scholar, uh, will come on March 4th to talk about allowing God to fill in the blanks, praying with the women of the New Testament. Um, so uh, we'll welcome Anne at that point and uh, that day and uh, hope that uh, that you'll be able to join us uh, and invite a friend. Okay, uh, Dr. Diaz, thank you so, thank so you much. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was nice to be here. And, and, I, and Anne Grito's great. I'm, I might join you too. Join us, yeah, yeah. We have another presentation that's happening in the diocese as well around preaching and Holy Week, but uh, which you're also welcome to join us if you like. Sure. All right. <laughs> so thanks so much, everyone, for coming. You know, drive safe, all of those good things. Oh, and Anne said, asked and Michael says, uh, and she said to say hello. So there you go. <laughs> all right. Yes. Uh, be safe, everyone. Okay, and uh, to to the day when we can meet in person. Bye bye. <laughs>